is high variability across the state. The majority of schools are in hybrid learning mode, so meaning they're, doing, they're offering some online instruction and some in-person instruction, and that can look different from school to school. There are still some schools that are completely 100% distance only, and then we have some schools that are now 100% in-person. So there is high variability across the state, but the majority are in some sort of hybrid learning mode. What are some of the conversations happening um, with you and other state leaders, school leaders, as far as, as what we need to be watching? for? We've been definitely keeping a very close eye on this. I'm very concerned to see the uptick in numbers across the state. This is both in urban and rural areas. Um, we have been in close communication with the Department of Health Services and continued conversation with the county health directors as well to make sure that we're in close communication about all the different mitigation strategies and what we need to be paying attention to. One observation that the, the health experts have shared with us is that the spread doesn't seem to be as prevalent for the K-8 schools. They're seeing more of, more of a higher risk at the high school level, and it, it does seem to be more attributed to the sports, to the athletics, which is very unfortunate because, of course, we know that sports are such an important component of schools and for students' mental health, but that it does seem to be an area that, that is showing greater concern for us. We have been in communication with AIA as well as with the Department of Health Services. And at the end of the day, the school leaders are looking for clear guidance on what they should be doing to make sure that their student athletes are safe. As we approach the winter, there's a lot of questions about wrestling and basketball. So we do need to be making sure that we're working together as state leaders to, to look at what are the, the risks versus the benefits of sports and make sure that we have really clear consensus and guidance for all of our schools. Do you think that districts could be getting more concrete guidance, whether it's from your department from the state or from county health officials? Yes, we have been working with the Department of Health Services and the county health directors to, to be able to provide clear guidance. That I see that as the role of the public health experts to be providing that clear guidance, but we are there advocating on behalf of our educators and school communities to make sure that that message and that information is disseminated as quickly and as, as effectively as possible. And as you speak with school leaders, teachers, parents, you know, everyone involved in the education community, what are some of the biggest concerns that you're hearing about? There's so many concerns. It really ranges of everything from student safety or from our teachers worrying, still worrying about their own safety and making sure that the schools have all the proper protocols and procedures in place. I've unfortunately heard from some teachers that this is the first time in their career that they don't like teaching, they don't like going to work. Um, this has been such a huge challenge for them to transition to online instruction and then going back and forth between online and in-person has created a lot of challenges. Um, I think our, our parents are feeling fatigued by all the unpredictability and the constant changes and now worrying about what the future holds for our school communities. Um, so my, my message to everyone is, is that this is a time when we need to have the strongest communication possible, that there needs to be constant and consistent communication and transparency from our schools to our families and also to the staff of each school, because building that trust and making sure that we have good, strong communication is what's gonna hold our communities together. And, and to have patience with each other, to appreciate each other, because this has just been this has been now almost eight months of this pandemic and this crisis, and, and these challenges are persisting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we've seen some more of that transparency recently with more districts creating these COVID dashboards and actually laying out, you know, how many cases they have in schools. Um, is that something that you guys would like to see more of from more of our school districts? Yes, I, I always err on the side of the, the more transparency, the better, because again, that, that helps to, to build that trust and it provides a consistent source of information because with, when in absence of that type of information and that, that clear line of communication, then our families are receiving information from social media or from their friends. And we, we really want that to be coming directly from the school leaders, from the district, from the charter, to make sure that the information is accurate and people know exactly where to find it. We have a majority of the schools in hybrid. We have some schools staying remote. We have some schools back in person. There's a lot of different things going on in different areas. And so, um, you know, looking 
to five years down the road, what are the potential impacts of that as far as learning loss and student achievement? I'm very concerned about the, the long-term impacts of COVID-19 and the impact, especially when it comes to learning loss and the disparities between different groups of students, especially thinking about our students who are most impacted by the digital divide, who may not have access to Wi-Fi or to the technology they need to access the curriculum. Um, so I am very concerned and I, I think it's going to take us a some time, even a couple of years, to truly know the full impact. Our department has been working with leaders across the state, working in close collaboration, doing everything we possibly can to, to minimize these negative impacts. And, and even, in, even just um, in the area of nutrition, for example, that it's only within the last couple of weeks that the, at the federal level, that the USDA, that they made a change in their their policy to allow again for any child to be able to receive meals from the school. So before there was a, a short period where they um, where this where it had to be students enrolled in the school, but now any child that needs food can access the breakfast or lunch meals from our school. So even the equity issues around meals and nutrition um, have been very concerning to me. But something that I'm, I'm glad we're now on a, a better path. But it's, this is across the board when we think about the mental health impacts and, as well as the, the, the academic learning loss in terms of reading and writing and math. And um, it, it's, very, it's very concerning to me, but we are doing everything we, we can to help support our schools and, and providing the supports and services that their students need. What sorts of efforts have continued to try and get technology, get internet, especially to these students who are going to be online for the long haul? Unfortunately, getting internet out to rural communities is not something that can happen overnight. These are typically millions upon millions of dollar projects that take months. And so when I've been talking with some of our superintendents, um, for example, I was talking to a group of superintendents in Mojave County, and they were sharing with me that that's an area where even the cell phones don't receive adequate service. So a hotspot is not going to help their students get online. Whereas in other areas where there might be a better cell service, a hotspot can help them um, help them with that gap. So unfortunately, while, while progress has been made in terms of the broadband internet infrastructure, we still have a lot of work to do that will take a significant amount of time and resources. We've been advocating at the federal level for more federal dollars to help us with that. We're starting to build stronger collaboration and stronger coalition with other organizations that have the same, the same goal because it's not just impacting us in terms of education. There's also areas of, of telehealth or other organizations that in terms of even work, work and business that would benefit from having uh, more more internet access across the state. So we're really trying to build those coalitions, work together, and engage the legislature, engage the federal leaders, and see what we can do together to close this gap. I think parents and, and school leaders are craving more up-to-date information and kind of a more concrete instruction on what to do as far as closing schools or quarantining students. Um, you know, why don't we have something like that at this time? I can understand why there's urgency around wanting to have immediate data, um, but I, I do think on the other side of that is that we don't want our schools to have what, what I would call the yo-yo effect of open one day, close the next day, and we don't want any of these decisions to be based out of fear or emotion. And there, this has become also a very divisive issue with, with some people who want all schools open immediately and others who are just still very fearful and want them to stay closed as long as we have COVID-19 in our communities. So I think that for all of us, the important thing is, is to be using the benchmarks, which the Department of Health Service Services has the great dashboard. Um, and then many of our counties also have clear dashboards. And, and my, gu my guidance, the way I've been coached on this from our public health experts, is to try not to look day to day, but really to look at the trends over a week or two weeks, because the numbers can shift so quickly. And, and so we, we do want to be keeping a close eye on that, but at the same time, be looking at the trends, the, the date over, over more than just day to day. Um, so I, I completely understand that, that need to want the immediate information, but 
to make informed decisions. We need to be looking at the metrics and they can look at that data. The county, the county health experts are looking at a very local level. They can look at the school district level, at the zip code level, and that's what's informing their decisions. Specifically, what sorts of things do you want people to know that you're doing? Well, I'm, as of now, we were coming up on November, and so I'm looking ahead to the next legislative session, which is right around the corner, starting in January. We have a long list of, of needs for our schools in terms of resources. Um, one of my biggest concerns has been around the digital divide issue, and so one um, area we're focused on is build, we're advocating and requesting from the legislature uh, $10 million annually of grant funding that the Department of Education would administer to our schools to, for specifically for digital teaching and learning needs. So that's just one example of a piece of legislation that, that we will be advocating for. I'm also very concerned about the teacher shortage, which has only grown worse in the last couple of months. And again, we don't have full data on that available to us, but from what I've seen so far, it, it is, Dis disturbing and devastating to me to know that we have lost more teachers in this time of crisis when when, we, when they're needed more than ever. And so I'm also looking ahead to see how, how can we support the field. And we are partnering with ASU, U of A, our, our university partners to do everything we can to make sure that there is high quality professional development for our educators. And again, making sure that our schools and their communities, the teachers and all of the school staff have the training and resources they need to be successful in this, in this very unique and brand new learning environment.